so we had Yuan taking us to um, the 19th century. And uh, so I would like to introduce um, Shataro Naka Nakano. <laughs> Uh, he, he is actually going to take us to the 16th century this time. And uh, it's, he had been a spy, I would say, and he's been looking at an unknown um, punch cutter. So let's hear his story. So over to you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Shotaro Nakano. I'm a Latin type designer working for GU Kobo. Today, I would like to introduce my project which is reviving a known 16th century Dutch type. I'm not a historian, but a type designer. I'm, I'm just an enthusiast of type history. So if I make a mistake, I have to apologize. But I did my best, so please listen it. First, I would like to show my result. The bottom one is, is mine, the top one is the original. As you see, the original type does not have high quality, I think that is the reason why nobody have ever paid attention for this type, and therefore nobody have ever re revived this type. I think I'm lucky. I like to work on a type that nobody knows. There are many mysteries that I can infuse my imagination, and there are a lot of potential that I can, uh, there are lots of potential that people have never been discovered. I was attracted to this type because I thought that the, this type must be a good representative of 16th century Dutch type. So today, I'm going to talk about this type and the research which I did. Here's the matrix. In fact, the matrix is still in the Pranta Mortis Museum. MA174 is a sign for indexing. I will call this type M as MA174 later. If you check the database of the museum, it said Francois Gear as a punch cutter. Huh, it's not the unknown punch. Francois Gear came from Paris and worked at Antwerp from 1539. The reason why he is attributed as punch cutter was simply because of the visual resemblance to his work. According to Hendrik Berberiet, who is a famous historian and who studies 16th century, said, several faces of type which appear in Antwerp printing about 5040 are more or less like those attributable with greater certainty to his activity in later years, and it might be ascribed to him on the ground of style. So it's pretty much just a visual resemblance that currently attributed him as a punch cutter for this type. And Barbary said that we know nothing with certainty, so we really, really don't know about this type. I originally worked on a type that is made by Hendrik van den Kier and his two-line double piker Roman. He is the most important figure in the 16th century lower countries. As you know, the biggest challenge to work on this type is to think about italic, because he did not cut any italic. So I have to do a research to think about what is appropriate style for, what is appropriate italic for this style. During the research, a page of a book catch my eye. It said, Richard two line double pica italic which, which was MA-174. The reason why it said Richard was that the first appearance of this type was in a book printed by John Richard in 1543. He is kind of like an obscure printer, so I don't know so much about him. The most famous printer who used this type was Gilles Coffins van de Est. He was a really active underground printer in the mid 16th century. As you know, at the time, there was a religious reformation. Many printer work as underground printer like him. He loved to use this type because he kept using this type even though the type became totally obsolete style. I don't know why he continued to use this type, but. Here is the enlarged image of this type. The detail that attracts me was the letter N. Look at this N. 
the terminal. The shape is almost like a diamond, and the stroke, uh, the construction of the letter is almost like interrupted. You know, there's a, almost like a two strokes. It, so the shape is almost like a, just a skewed texture type, and the overall color of this italic is really dark. This feature immediately associates Gala Hollandur, which is a term to describe Dutch type. The feature of Gala Hollandur are heavy, condensed, having large X height. I think heaviness is really important because when first Dutch people started to use Roman type, they often put Roman together with textura type. Van den Kiel's two-line double pica Roman is also made to use with textula type. Once I started to do a research on this type, I immediately find an example of this type used with black letters. Interestingly, this type had two different weight variants. I don't know any other type having weight variant in the 16th century. Existence of a weight variant supports the idea that this type must this type was intended to be used with black letters. After I understood the design, I started to wonder who was the punch cutter of this type. It was not convincing that the type was made by Francis Gill. The quality of his type were much higher, and his letter forms were cursive and froze really well. Here is the timeline of Gill's activities. He might he might cut many more types, but there are six there were six types that were firmly associated with him. Three Romans and three Italics. As you see, he cut Roman first, then he cut Italics later. If he cut MA 174, then it might be a little strange. Here is a comparison of major, major Italic in the 16th century. The first one is, of course, Francesco Griffo. And second one is Aligi, and third one is Simon de Collins. I think you know because he's Parisian. And uh, fourth one is a Vesel Italic. This is the one that uh, has a sloped capitals and was used by Sebastian Griffiths in 1537. The fifth one is a type of Lelouge. It's not so much well known, but since here is Paris, people might know. Uh, this is considered as the first Parisian Italic. And the sixth one is the one I'm researching, MA 174. And the seventh is Grand Jones. He cut a lot of Italics, but this is the, uh, I think, oldest one as far as know. And the final one is Franz Regil. As you see, one, two, three, seven, eight are really similar, and maybe force, force two as well. But the fifth one is somewhat similar to MA-174, uh, this one, you know, uh, because the stroke is interrupted and somehow showed Gothic influence. Here's a more image of Lelouch Italic. Hendrik, Hendrik Burberry said that this type can be called Fair humanistic cursive, or you can say Gothico Antico Italic. It means that the type is a mixture of Gothic and Roman. I really don't know it is as a type that can be called Fair humanistic Italic. Because when Francisco Griffo made Italics, they were already beautiful, and there was no reason to make Gothico Antico Italic or Fair humanistic cursive. So I thought that if I trace the lineage of this type, it might be possible to detect who was the punch cutter of MA-174. The Italic is used by Guillaume Lelouch. His family has a relationship with Nicholas Jensen. 
His daughter is Francois Lelouch. She married with Martin de Kisser. I don't know what was I'm pronouncing really well or not, but I'm sorry. Martin de Kisser moved from Paris to Antwerp and became a major punch cutter and top supplier in the 16th century. So it's, it looks like he may be, but um, he's not a punch cutter of M M MA-174 because he died in 1536 and the first appearance of the type was 1543. So I couldn't fill the gap to explain. And the Martin de Kisser, he did not cut any textura type. He, you know, he's came from Paris, so his, his preferable block letter style was a bastarda. So my, my first hypothesis was failed, but I realized, I realized that Nordisk music also has the matrix as NS, NS-174 along with capitals. The one in Panta Mortis Museum didn't have the capitals, but this one has capital as well. I don't know whether this capital were cut by the same person and cut by the same year, but if it was cut by the same person in the same year, it must be really interesting. Because I really don't know the type that has sloped capital earlier than this type. Even Robert Grunjun, Arius Italic, was cut in 1543. The only Italic had successful sloped capital was the one was used by Sebastian Griffiths in 1537. Here is a comparison of some capitals. The first one is the basal italic, and the second one is MA-174, and the third one is, one is made by Gill, and the fourth one is Robert Grunchens, and the fifth one is actually not italic, but uh, the, the one is made by uh, Gill's, and the sixth one is the basal capitals. The reason why I put Roman capitals is that Alec, Axel Nielsen, who studied the collection of the Nordisk Museet, pointed out the resemblance between MA-174 and Basel capitals. And I, I, I agreed with him, and I realized it before I read his essay. So let's look at more letters. Um, here's, here's a comparison of the details. R is really similar to Basel capitals. Even though it is sloped, you know, this one is MA-174, MA and this one is a basal capitals. And, uh, and also, it is important to note that the top part of the arrow is slightly concave. I think this is a feature of the basal capitals. I know that the M is kind of like obsolete Jensen style. But if you look at the leg of M, it's slightly lifted. It may be close to a basal italic. Having prominent serif are an important feature of the basal capitals. They appear in Gio's Roman, but not in his italic, but in MA-174. Other interesting feature that I should mention is the thick horizontal stalk in A, but not in E. This combination happened in the vertical capitals as well. The most distinctive, distinctive letters in the capitals are K and P, and they were close to Gill, but I don't know whether I can attribute this feature to Gill. Because if you look at the contemporary writing manual written by Mercator, the similar form can be seen. So here's my conclusion. Although the punch cutter of MA-174 MA is not known, it appears to be distinct from the work of Francois Gill and instead show greater similarity to the Berzo capitals and italic. The type was beloved by underground printer and had a nice, nice touch taste, dark color and affinity with black leather. Therefore, it must be a good representative of 16th century Dutch, both in culturally and typographically. So I think this type must work well with Van den Kia's two-line double pike Roman. Thank you for listening.
Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for around two questions this time, and uh, and can we open it up to the floor? Any questions? Hands up. Uh, you can raise your hands. Any questions? No, none from the audience? Okay. So um, I will have one. <laughs> uh, would you like to share, um, uh, share with the audience on how you actually, uh, what actually made you want to do something like this? Uh, since you said that you were a type uh, designer and want to be a spy and actually go back into history because you have done uh, more than what was expected from um, from what you do as a profession and also you know going into the lineage of these people uh, it's quite uh, commendable so what wanted you to do this well I'm 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 just well hmm. <laughs> I just really want to want to understand uh, the, the style, um, whoa. Oh. I, I would say it would have been your passion, right? You yeah, would have yeah. wanted it's, to, okay. It's pretty much uh, yeah. my passion, yeah. Well, there is not so much a good uh, art history book in Japan, so I, I'm kind of like craving to know what the type history. So whenever I make it a uh, repeatable type, I buy a lot, quite a lot of books, and intensively analyze what, what what's happened in the history, and then I started to make my works usually. So, probably that's just my regular approach. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm sure you should meet up with Yovan as well, uh, the previous talker who was also uh, digging into history. So we had an awesome session. So thank you very much. Um, we. <laughs> We had a, a round of four speakers. We started off with the archives, and then we, we got a touch of what was new, and then followed by uh, going into the history. So with this, we conclude for the tea break. <laughs> Thank you.